question. Sure. <clears throat> Do you anticipate um, go to the the going to be a, a problem with uh, people um, in the Canadian Native community uh, distributing marijuana like they have been distributing tobacco from roadside shacks? So, for example, you go through Oka, you would see them selling mm -hmm. cigarettes at the side of the road or in, in, in any other uh, Native community, similar things are happening. Do you think the law doesn't apply to them and they'll be able to do a distribution themselves? Well, the First Nations is a part of the, uh, uh, part of CACP and uh, that is a concern. Uh, but the regulations will be across the board. Uh, we, we don't know what the, uh, uh, if that position will be taken. That's a question we have as well. But uh, it's possible, but uh, the regulations stand the way they are. Um, it depends on the province. The province it, it determines the regulations and how it's going to be distributed. Uh, but right now, that's not been determined. But as far as First Nations and, and what they decide, uh, that'll have to be determined. We don't know what, what that position is going to be in. And how does the uh, policing community in Canada expect to police uh, online websites like Budmail and other sites like that that are simply selling today to anybody. You don't have to have a, um, a, a medical card or proof that you do, yet uh, those uh, materials are delivered to the consumer through Canada Post. Yes, we're aware of that. And uh, anyways, we're the deep dark web. There's lots of opportunities to sell illegal products. We do have the task force uh, that does address that, but it is a problem that we, we, we do anticipate that, particularly with social sharing. And I have one last question. Um, people are allowed, or will be allowed, to grow up to four plants at home. Um, and then uh, in the community, there's been some talk of organizing a large uh, uh, condo grow where people would be able to come in and um, access a small area, a secure area to grow their own marijuana, either indoors or outdoors. Are you aware of that and would you support that? Uh, under the legislation, that's not supported whatsoever. I know we would not support that. Thank you. Yes, next person. Hello. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation today. Um, question is, when recreational cannabis is legalized, what is the reason for implementing harsher sentences when very harsh sentences were already enforced? Do the Canadian people need to be punished more? The harsh sentencing is uh, focused on targeting the youth. So you see uh, the legislation is about targeting to the youth. So that's where the increased penalties are. Uh, but as, as far as uh, regulatory, uh, you've seen fines as well. Uh, from uh, a youth perspective, fines is not being criminalized, but uh, if you're trafficking to youth, you're going to see very, very severe penalties. Okay, so basically the Canadian people need to be punished worse than before when it comes to uh, trafficking to the youth. To the youth, yes. Understood. Thank you very much. Just a quick question about, you mentioned that the ACMP on the commercial regulated program, the security um, levels, the quality levels are higher than the black market and the other um, types of production. And I'm wondering, just a couple of questions. First of all, um, <clears throat> have there been any crime concerns with the new regulated MMPR, ACMPR marketplace from the PC side? Anything you're aware of that even though they're very well secured, that may cause a level of concern, number one. <clears throat> number two, in the current ACMPR market, what are the weak points or the crime vulnerabilities in your view, perhaps transportation or other aspects that we want to look at in the new Cannabis Act, maybe addressing to make sure that there's no weak points in between the supply chain, if you will, of cannabis from production through the sale? I think uh, I mentioned earlier, uh, one of the concerns from the AC, uh, new regulation, the ACMPR, is the fact that you can designate someone to produce your product, like up to two people, and I include that person. So, how do we, it's going to be a question of, uh, with, with the linking of the new Cannabis Act, uh, so when we do a traffic stop, we intervene with these people, uh, you know, we're going to have to have some validation behind that. And that we feel that is a weak point uh, from our perspective. 
the transportation, uh, we haven't had any major issues. Uh, the licensed producers are very, uh, the, the ones, there's a few that are problematic. And uh, I think the inspection, uh, the folks that do the inspection would probably be a better person to answer, but from a law enforcement perspective, uh, the good ones run a very good job. Thank you for the information sharing, it's very helpful. My question relates to the saliva testing or the fluid testing and the levels, the thresholds have been, have been established in the, uh, in the bill. And the suggestion that, or the, the sense from a science perspective that there is a clear correlation between the level of THC and impairment. And I'm wondering how, for example, that's going to be contemplated at the roadside where somebody may not be by the other first two tests you talked about uh, showing signs of actual impairment, whereas a regular medical user who uses medical cannabis on a daily basis may in fact have more than two nanograms or maybe five, uh, and effectively they could be at risk of, of you know, violating the law even though they might not, uh, in fact, um, fail your, your impairment testing at the roadside. So any thoughts about that? Well, um, that might be a question more for the traffic committee, but uh, from uh, the nanograms are low for a reason. Uh, as you know, THC uh, disseminates from your body very, very quickly. Uh, and uh, the focus is going to be public safety and, and driving. So it's, it's low for a reason so that we can make sure that our roads are safe. Uh, and I know that there was, uh, there's some science behind the reasoning behind it. Uh, some countries have chosen five nanograms, some have chosen two, some have chosen uh, if you test uh, uh, positive, that's it, you're, you're done. Uh, but uh, the, the, the government has, has, has commissioned uh, some researchers, and uh, I'm not familiar how they came up with those numbers, but I understand the reasoning behind them and why they're so low is because of the uh, dissemination of it and how, how quickly it can go through. So, at the roadside, would officers be looking for evidence of impairment in terms of compromised functioning in addition to the blood levels, or would the blood levels, the fluid levels, be sufficient to, to be? Um, we haven't seen what the final outlook for uh, the bill is going to be, but uh, if you look at it from an impairment perspective, it's, it's in its totality. It's not just a case of, you know, uh, uh, as a person consumed. It's about, uh, you know, the standardized field sobriety test provides some indicators about physical impairment. Uh, and uh, if, if approved roadside devices are, are put into place, then it will provide the officers some additional evidence of what's in their system at the moment, because it'll be just, it won't be just cannabis, it'll be other drugs as well, including the presence, presence of. Well, that will be enough for them to bring it to a drug recognition expert and maybe go to, uh, you know, deal with the phlebotomist and, and go with the blood, blood reading from there. So it's, it's going to be a serious thing, it's not just one thing. Okay, thank you. Question? Yeah, um, I hope it's a short question, but I'm just wondering. As I move towards setting up a small business, whether it's a retail storefront or some sort of lounge, what's the best way to engage with the local police? Like, should I make an appointment, come and see someone, say, here's my plans, do you have some comments? Um, you know, assuming that it's going to be in a reasonable zone area of the city and such, what's the best way to work with you? I think the first start, first of all, we don't know what the, what the legislation is going to right. work at. So, so once they do, yeah. I think the focus needs to be on what's the city going to permit? You know, going to your, uh, your local city folks and see if make sure there's no bylaws. Uh, I, I would imagine that you're going to be setting up, um, if, if they allow consumption rooms or allow uh, areas where you can use, it's going to be specific. You're not going to see it in your schools. You're not going to see it. So I would imagine that uh, your local municipality will create a great degree of rules behind it. I'm not even sure if the consumption room will, be, will actually be permitted. So maybe talk to my local yeah, talk to, uh, politicians I would say rather than the police? Wait and see, yeah. Because we're going to be, we don't know what we're going to be regulating quite yet because right now it's just a bill. And our experience with bills, uh, what we see now may not be what we see in the law down the road. Uh, but once we understand that, we'll absorb it, uh, address it, learn from it, and uh, uh, apply it. But I think you're, you're looking also, you have got to deal with your local municipalities. Yeah, I'm looking at like who I talk to sort of plan out these possible scenarios. So have a look at uh, the cannabis act, because I don't believe consumption rooms are addressed in that to start with, so that may be a problem. And then uh, if, if it actually does, uh, it does make it down the road, I think your local municipality and, and, and the city 
is going to have a huge, huge influence to where it goes. I don't have to make a nice presentation to the police and say, here's us. my area, <laughs> this is what I want to do. Yeah. Well, it's always nice for us to know that's good intel on our yeah. part. Okay, yes. thanks. Thank you. Last question. Hello again. Uh, you may, may not be aware, uh, but Uruguay was able to push the criminals out of their the cannabis market. Uh, the government legalized cannabis for recreational use, and they, the government helps ensure the cost sorry, of the gram down to one dollar per gram for everyone. Uh, by doing so, they basically undercut all criminal activity. Uh, so my question is, do you think Canada should do like Uruguay? I'm aware of what uh, Uruguay is doing, and uh, it's a very interesting experiment, and, and they focus a lot on treatment as well. That's one of the things that uh, makes it a success. And they're trying to eliminate the black market from that aspect. It's a, uh, but uh, is Canada ready for it? I don't think so. Um, we've got a long way to go. I think we need to have the treatment facilities in place uh, to address that first. And then if that's the way it's going to go, then uh, we need to have that all that system in place before we even entertain that. Because I think uh, treatment is a big thing uh, that Uruguay is looking at. And they focus on that. You see, Portugal does the same thing. What treatment? I'm talking about recreational cannabis. They legalize for recreational reasons, just like we will. Mm -hmm. And they basically are uh, the government's paying the companies who grow the cannabis uh, for the amount of uh, for the costs down to one dollar. Basically, the companies are able to sell the cannabis at one dollar a gram to the to the people of Uruguay. Uh, while the government's paying for the extra cost. I don't think uh, Canada's ready for that, and I don't know whether, whether our residents are willing to um, pay for that. Oh, I understand. Down the road, maybe, as I said, start, start restricting, loosen things up, but I personally don't think anybody's ready for that. Okay. Thank you very much Thank for you. your presentation. There was one more question. Quick question. Um, there was a lot of mention of oral fluid, and um, I've also heard that there's some companies doing research into breathalyzer type uh, machines, and uh, there is kind of like a wide variety of, of other devices. So, as the uh, I guess the the the, the, uh, the police chief's uh, I'm sorry, so the government actually has just two devices that they're testing at the moment, uh, and both of them are involved with oral fluids, uh, and they have different ways of doing it. Uh, they both have some advantages, both have some disadvantages, but no, I'm not familiar what exactly tests they've done, whether they're looking at uh, from a breath perspective. So, so breath would not be considered an oral fluid, right? I guess it's just like a no, so saliva not. sample or a yeah, so tissue you, sample. There's a, uh, a device you put in that, that extracts your saliva and is tested in a device. They've got two right now, and it's a, it's a determination of what works for, from a law enforcement perspective, what provides accurate information, and what is acceptable. So there's a lot of work behind choosing that device. Uh, I've seen both devices and some aspects, I wish they would take the two and merge them. Some aspects I don't like to do one, but uh, uh, it's, there's, there's nothing perfect, but they're working on it now. Once it's, and when they go through the approval process, it has to meet the standard. It's like, it's like a, it's the roadside for alcohol. It's got to meet the standard. It doesn't meet the standard. Thank you very much.